second part of the series of messages on the miracles of Jesus. How many of y'all need one beside me today? Amen. Amen. If we're really honest, uh, we would see these miracles of Jesus and rejoice because it just shows a demonstration of the power of God. Remember in our first sermon on the miracles of Jesus, we talked about that word of miracle and how it literally translates, I believe in the King James, even in John it translates, instead of miracle, it translates to sign. Because that's exactly what that word means in the original context of everything Jesus. Every miracle was a sign. Now, I'm certainly not taking away from the fact that they were miracles. I mean, it was a supernatural invasion into a natural world where God just obviously intervenes and does something beyond the norm. But uh, and I believe God still does miracles today. But by the way, you being here today and not dead or in hell, that's a miracle. Amen? God has intervened on your behalf and given you life another day and has blessed you another day. I really believe one day when we put off and shed this old man, become, you know, that glorified creature in Christ Jesus and stand in the, in the portals of glory in heaven and look at our life in replay, that we're going to see time in and time out over and over and over again the miraculous intervention of God in our lives. How if God had not done something, even though we may not be aware of it today, I believe we're going to see then, if it had not been for God's intervention and God sovereignly moving in our affairs in a miraculous way, there's no telling where we would have ended up or how we would have ended up. I believe God's committed to his children. I believe God is a loving father and a gracious father who desires to, you know, just like the song we just sang, oh, how he loves us. It's almost indescribable in words of how much God really is committed to you and how much God really does love you and how much God really cares about you. And I, I know we all come through those satanic attacks where if God loves me so much, yeah, hey, get over it. God does love you. And one day you're gonna see just how incredible that genuine love of God really was for your life. And we love him because he first loved us and how we praise God for that. But if we look at the miracles and we see the signs of Jesus, all these signs, miracles, are are, they're like posters, they're like billboards on the highway of life that declare Jesus is who he says he is. Jesus is God in the flesh, God incarnate. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is Lord. So every one of these miracles declare that. And at the same time, as I said last week, it's always interesting to look at these miracles as they're recorded in Scripture within the framework of what's going on, within the context of what's happening in that moment. Because then you see that these miracles are not only these supernatural displays that, well, they testify to the glory of, of Christ, but they're also lessons. I mean, it, it's like PowerPoint on the, <laughs> of life, you know. He gives this powerful point he, he's making in, in message or in sermon, and then this miracle happens, which underscores what's happening around him, sometimes underscores things that are probably not even seen by other men, but Jesus knows the hearts of men, and he does something to reveal their hearts to them. So there's, it, it's an interesting and, 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 and exciting study as you go through the scriptures. As much as I possibly could, and along with the help of a lot of theological dictionaries and commentaries, I've tried to go through these miracles in a chronological form, in a, in a chronological order. So as we can kind of get the flow of the life of Christ as we take the Gospels and put them in kind of a comparative way and look at the events when they happen. And you can kind of geographically as well as historically follow the timeline of the life of Jesus by putting all the Gospels together. The first miracle we saw was at the wedding of Cana. These are the miracles that Jesus performed. Obviously, the first miracle about Jesus is the virgin birth, amen? But the first miracle that he actually performs that we have recorded in Scripture was the, the wedding of Cana, where, in, where he turns the water into wine. By the way, that'll be repeated in history prophetically when we, the church, are standing in heaven with the Lord at the wedding feast, or the bride of Christ, and he's, he's there at that glorious wedding as well. So as far as the church is concerned, he starts his ministry that way and kind of concludes it at a wedding, amen? And I'm looking forward to that day as well. But as you move forward in time, and Jesus is moving forward, it's some short time, some days, the scriptures record that after that, then you see Jesus performing this second miracle, which is at the Sea of, well, one translation says Gennesaret, another says the Sea of Galilee. So this is the miracle of fish. And really I've kind of subtitled it, Failure, the Doorway to Discovery because that's exactly what's, what's happening here. That, that, that in the midst of a problem, in the midst of Peter's failure and their inability to accomplish something, the Lord demonstrates his power and he demonstrates his glory and they see God on the scene and, and God's working miraculously. Let's look at scripture today and see what it says here. It says, now it came about 
while the multitudes were pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, that's the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake. Fishermen had gotten out of them, and they were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked him to put out a little way from the land, and he sat down, and he began teaching the multitude from the boat. You say, well, what was he teaching him? Well, the Bible says in verse 1, he's teaching the word of God. Verse 4 says, and when he had finished speaking, it's kind of funny, he says, when he's finished speaking, he speaks, all right, but he's speaking to the crowd. When he's finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night, caught nothing, but at your bidding I will let down the nets. And when they'd done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. And they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and to help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they both, the boats began, began to sink. Verse 8, but when Simon Peter saw, saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For amazement had seized him and all his, his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they brought their boats to the land, they left everything and they followed him. Now this is, a, this is that beginning call of the disciples to go out and begin that ministry of catching men, of making disciples, of reaching people for the kingdom of God. And God begins to take these ordinary men and now begins to do extraordinary things with their lives. Now this is gospels recorded, uh, the two other gospels record this particular story, but it's the gospel here that, that really details the, the conversation between Simon Peter and the Lord himself. And it, it, it kind of deals with that issue where the Lord has been, first of all, speaking to the crowd, and then he turns and he begins to speak to Simon Peter specifically and uniquely. In fact, the Bible tells us in verse 1, as I mentioned, that they came to hear the Word of God. Now, somehow the structure of all that got changed around. It used to be a lot more readable, but somehow the machine didn't understand my fonts. If y'all understand me, I, we're all on the same page. Anyway, they came to hear the Logos, which is the, the Word of God. Now, the Logos can be referred to as the written Word of God or the spoken Word of God. Jesus, by the way, is referred to as the Logos, the Word of God. He is the living Word of God. Amen. He's the personification of the Word of God. He is the Word of God come in the flesh. And so the people that come by the lake, they're obviously hearing of Jesus' teaching. They're gathering by hundreds, if not by thousands now, at the beginning of these messages. And there's, he's, he, he's there, he's standing by the lake of, of Gennesaret, and he's speaking to them the word of God. Now, Jesus, at this point, he turns from speaking to the, to the mass and speaking to the crowd, and he begins to you know, speak to Peter. First of all, in verse 3, the Bible says he's teaching the people from the boat. Now, those of you who've been to Israel with us or perhaps had the, 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 the blessing to go into this part of the world and see these places, you know, the Sea of Galilee is kind of like a bowl. It's just surrounded by these, these mountains, and they, they made perfect auditoriums. So here's Jesus, and the, the land slopes down to the lake. He's down at the bottom of the lake, and on, on, not the bottom, literally the, the bottom of the, 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 the hills there. And he's in that boat speaking to the group, pressing out a little bit so that everyone can see and everyone can hear and he gets in the boat and he's speaking the word of God. Now, the word of God there is a Greek word that's just called, you know, the, the, the Logos word. But it, things begin to change. In verse 4 now, he stops the sermon and he turns to Peter and he speaks to Peter in the boat. And by the way, as far as location-wise, the best place for Jesus is in your boat. The best place for Christ is to be in your life. If you're out on the shore and you're still living in a distant relationship with Jesus, it's time to drop that and get in a boat with Christ. It's time to give your heart completely over to him. Because he's got something on a more personal level that he wants to do in your life. But as long as you're just kind of the crowd and you just kind of hear the Bible and that's about it, and you might like preaching and you might like hearing the Bible. I mean, there's a lot of people who like sermons. I mean, they like, they like hearing the Bible. But not a lot of people like living the Bible and following the Bible and trusting Jesus with their life. That's like that crowd. But Jesus is dealing now in a more personal relationship to the group he's giving what we call the Logos word. It's a preached word. It's a spoken word. It's a written word. And he's sharing that. But when he talks to Peter, the, 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 now the discourse begins to change because what he's going to do with Peter, he's going to speak more uniquely 
more personally and more specifically to him. There's a Greek word for that as well, and it's called rhema. Now, if you've been a Christian long at all and know what's kind of gone on in the Christian culture, there was at one time, still out there, a, a group called the rhema movement. And basically, rhema means revealed, that which is revealed truth. And out of that Raymond movement came the prosperity doctrines and the name it, claim it, frame it, and all those things kind of came forth. That if, that if it's written in the Bible, it's, it's for everybody. If, if God says to somebody in the Bible, I'm going to bless you, that means he's going to bless me. God says to Job, I'm going to give you, you know, make the richest man in the world. It means to, I'm going to be the richest man in the world. Whatever, whatever I can read, I can, I can claim for myself, all right? Now, there are obviously promises in the Word of God that all of us are to be embracing and all of us are to be claiming. Salvation promise is the first and most obvious, amen? If you'll repent, believe that Christ will save you, he'll come into your life. But the key is now, he's no longer speaking in a general sense. He's now speaking in a specific sense. And this is the word rhema in Scripture. It was a word for salvation. Simon from the Lord. There are times in our life where because we're familiar with the Word of God in general, that God will speak a Word of God specifically. It's a word for me. It's a word in my circumstance. It's a word in my situation. It's a word that I need. And God takes that real general term, a real general passage, and now begins to show me in my heart that that word is for me. How many of you have ever just been reading the word, and all of a sudden something just leap off the page, like, like something God's saying to you, believe this. Trust me on this. Claim this. This is something you can, all right? It's, it, it's the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit to speak to us and, and take the Word of God and speak to us in very specific ways, in very a specific sense. So I just don't go through the Scriptures claiming anything and everything. God will show me where I'm supposed to stand. God will show me what I'm supposed to believe. God will show me how to apply his word in my life. And when that happens, such as with Peter, then that word is no longer just a general word to the audience. It's a word specifically to me. And the word Jesus tells Peter is, push the boat out first of all. Get in the deeper water. And then once you get out in the deeper water, I want you to let down your nets. Because you're going to catch some fish. All right? So the Lord's telling him what he's going to do and what's going to happen as a result of what he does. I believe... Because of the Word of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life, that we can get words like that, where we know just what the Lord wants us to do. It's just that the will of God becomes obvious. I'm, and I believe if you've known the Lord for very long at all, you've had those moments in your life like that. I mean, just where, that's, that's, that's what God wants. It's clear. It's as though there's this peace in my heart about it. There's this, this ringing true in my life and my mind that this is what God wants us to do. Now, the word rhema in the Greek language is used in, in Scripture. In fact, one of the places it's used when it talks about in Ephesians, about putting on the whole armor of God. And it talks about, you know, the, the helmet and the breastplate and, your, and, and your, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It talks about when you're in spiritual battle, you take up the shield of faith, you know, which is able to quench all the, the fiery darts of the wicked one and take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, when the Bible translates, when Jesus over here in Luke, and it translates the word, he's preaching the word to them, it's the word logos. Now, the word used and the Holy Spirit gives to the writers of scripture by, I believe, divine inspiration. So no word is just kind of casual. They're all unique and they're all specific and they're words from God. The translators of the word of God are given this word to use in the language of the Bible. Do not use logos. The word I want you to use here is rhema. That's the word there for the word of God. You take up the word of God. I believe this is what was, what was happening in the wilderness but prior to these two miracles we talked about. When Jesus was in that temptation, great temptation. 40 days of fasting and the enemy, Satan, comes to him and tries to tempt him. You know the story. And every temptation that Satan gave him, throw yourself down, turn this into bread. Whatever it was, he said, you know, Jesus answered specifically with the word of God. It wasn't just a word of God. It was a word of God for the moment, for the time, specifically to fight and combat the enemy. In other words, it's a word that you know is God's word for that moment. It's a word you know that's personal. It's a word you know that's practical. God is, it's a powerful word. That's rhema, all right? I believe that's that time when there's an application of the word of God to my life and to my situation. That's when the logos becomes rhema. Now, if you understand some of that, say, uh-huh. The rest of you can watch the tape back. All right? But the idea here is that, you know, God is giving Peter some specific words to him. You know, that this is what I want you to do. Now, Peter has some words of his own. We've already done that. In fact, we did it all night long, and it didn't work. Don't you hate somebody come along telling you what 
what to do when you already know what to do? When you're in the business of doing whatever it is and somebody shows up? I mean, Jesus has got a carpenter's background. He's not a fisherman. All right, what's he know? And maybe Peter knows of Jesus, at least knows where he's from, understands a little bit about the personality, and he said, hey, you know, it's not like, come on. I'm not a novice here. You know, I'm not a moron. I know what I'm doing. This is where the lesson gets interesting. If we can hear the word of God, we find most of the time, even though we know what we're doing, we don't always succeed. And sometimes there's these moments of failure in our life that we need to learn from. And if we don't learn what God wants us to learn in these moments by hearing this specific word to us, then we're certainly going to miss the lesson. And even more importantly, we're going to miss the miracle that God wants to perform in our life. Peter's a fisherman. He knows what he's doing. He's been fishing all night. Because on the Sea of Galilee, that's when you fish, all right? That's the best time to go fishing on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is very deep, all right? And so what happens, and why fishermen fish at night on the Sea of Galilee is because the fish come to the shallower waters at nighttime when the sun's not reflecting off the waters anymore. They come and they begin the feeding process by moving to the shallower waters. That's why the fishermen fished at night, and that's why they fished in the shallower waters, because that's where they caught most of the fish. Now Jesus wants to go out in the daylight, in the bright sun, out to the deep water, our nets don't go so deep. They only go so far, right? So he wants us to go in the deep water and catch fish. Lord, we've done that. And maybe in the back of his mind he's thinking, this ain't going to work. Why is it not going to work? Because I know what I'm doing. And I know how to do what I, this is my career. That's why it's not going to work. Everybody knows. And it's amazing how everybody knows and really everybody knows nothing. Isn't it amazing that God always moves in, in the opposite of what men know or expect? Shallow water, deep water. Well, let's do deep water. Well, you don't catch fish. Go deep water anyway. Given it shall be given. Do what? I thought given I shall have more. Given I can put in the bank. Given I can get some interest. Given I can, I, I, I'll keep it for myself. No, given it should be given. You want to live? Yes, I want to live life. Then die. Excuse me? I said I want to live. I don't want to die. But if you want to live, then you've got to die to yourself. It's just, it, that's the way of, of the word of God. It's the way of that God, you know, he says, my ways are not your ways. So if that is true... And if we really believe that to be true, then probably the best thing you and I need to do is listen to the Word of God. What is God saying to you? What is God saying to you in your life right now? That you think you really know what's going on, and you don't have any idea. How often does that occur in our life? We really think we got a handle on it, and we don't have a handle at all. We're not even near the handle, by the way, amen? Uh, we just, by the way, especially if we have not succeeded and we fail, we, we like to kind of waller in our misery a little bit. We did that all night long, and it didn't work. Charlie Brown put it this way. Y'all know that great theologian, Charlie Brown, from Peanuts. It makes no difference if you win or lose until you lose. <laughs> Amen. Winston Churchill put it this way. He said, success is the ability to go from failure to failure without losing our enthusiasm. Because that's exactly what happens sometimes. Amen. The key here, though, we're going to talk about is, are, am I willing to hear the word of God? Am I willing to submit to, to what the Lord Jesus might have to say? And what he says here, he says, cast out your nets. We're going to go fishing in the deeper water. And Peter does at this point, he concedes to him. He says, okay, we've done this all night long, but I love it, master. He recognizes already the authority of Jesus is preaching. All right. And maybe he knows about the wedding at Cana. Maybe he's there in the crowd at the wedding. It's not that far away from where they're at. All right. So he says, Master, at thy word, you know, we'll do what we'll do what you say. So he lets out, pushes out the boat. They get in the deep water. He lets out the net. And we know we know what happens here. We know there's this great catch. There's this great abundance of fish, so much so that the partners in the fishing business have to come over and load their boats. And now the boats are sinking because they've loaded them so much up. But I want to talk about the, the context of this today in regard to our failures. And draw you a couple of quick points here, and then I want to come up with just a few more things just after that. But I want to tell you how important it is that we do get to the place of failure in our lives, because until we get to the place of failure, we'll never discover our own inabilities. We really, don't, we really think that we're capable. But how often in our lives have we come to the end of ourselves and everything we have tried has not worked? It might be in your marriage, it might be in your finances, it might be in raising children, it might be just in regard to life in general. You just, this, 
it's just falling apart. I prayed with a man today like that. His marriage was falling apart. His life's falling apart. Everything's just turning, falling apart with him right now. And he says, you know, this message about learning about failure is just the message I need because now I realize that in the midst of all this, God's trying to speak to me like he was trying to show Peter something. And so we get to this place to see, you know, our inability. It was Jesus himself who told us in John, without me, you can do nothing. There's no way I'm really going to accomplish fullness in life and the grace of life, success in life, really, if I don't include him in my life. In fact, if it's not following him, I'll never find success in my life. And there are so many people falling into this same category right here whose life they just feel is just, you know, they're just going. They're just doing. They're just getting to work and going home, watching TV and going to bed. That's it. I mean, there's not, there's not really, they're, 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 they're doing their jobs and they're, they're, they're raising kids or they're, you know, they're, they're going to school or whatever it might be. But it's just so empty. You know, it doesn't seem like, you know, there's this labor in life, but there's no fruit from the labor of life. Failure, if we can get to this place, we discover, hey, I can't do this anyway. God didn't design me to live my life apart from him. So I learned in this point, I need someone else, and who I ultimately need is the Lord. Also, failure causes us, as it does to Peter, to seek him. I mean, all this failure, and then seeing this success and this magnificent display of the grace of God brings Peter to the place to say, hey, I need to, I need to do what God says. I need to trust what God is saying. I need to respond to the Word of God and to the will of God and realize that he has something he wants to do in my, what, my life. I don't know who said it, but they said it well. He says, you know, when you have no other place to look but up, then you're in the right place. Until we get to that place, I think we'll always kind of, kind of do it on our own. And in this Christian life, folks, I hate to tell you this, if that's the way you're, you're approaching it, it's not going to work for you. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's like getting out of an 18-wheeler semi-truck loaded up with everything to be loaded on it, and you're behind it trying to push it. You're not going to budget. It's not, and I don't care how big you are, how strong you are, it ain't happening. It's, that's the way life is without Christ. God, because God simply did not create you to live with this emptiness in your life and to live apart from him and to not have a relationship with him. Real life comes with the introduction of Jesus into your life, with an acceptance and a, and a willingness to say, I am not able to live this life without him. Jesus said that I have come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. When I get there, then I get into living. Until I come to that place, I am nothing. I am empty. I'm nothing but a hunk of warm meat walking around. No life, no fullness. No impact, no intensity, no intention. Just drifting along like some kind of pinball on a machine, bouncing off one bumper and another bumper. Everything, all my circumstances, all my situations are dictated by some other force, and it is not God. When God wants to give your life direction, failure can be a great discovery of Him in your life. But failure also does something else. Failure is what allows the supernatural to begin to take place in my life, all right? It introduces me to the, to the possibility of the fullness of life that God has for me. It brings me to the place to realize, hey, you know, that, that I need Christ. And if I do embrace Christ, then life can mean something. In fact, you know, the obvious, the practical lesson was, hey, if you get Jesus in your boat, you can get a boatload of fish. Or even more practical than that, if you want to go fishing, be sure to invite Jesus. Amen. Because there was this practical need that was met. I mean, there's lots of fish in the boat. In fact, there's so many fish... The other boats have to get involved. But isn't that the way it really ought to be in our life? When we really get Christ in charge of our life, when he's really given the directions, when we're really letting him call the shots, how often it begins to involve other people and affect other people in a good way where they begin to receive fullness and blessing and restoration as well. It never was intended just to kind of stop with me, what I get. And now, by obedience, I begin to discover the supernatural, that God will invade. God will get involved. God does move in his people. God does work in the hearts and the lives of, uh, of the people who allow him to do so. But until we get to the place of realizing that we shouldn't be in control of our life and that we ought to surrender our hearts to him, we're not going to learn this. We're still going to live with that attitude that I'm good enough for this and I yeah, pull myself up by my bootstraps. I know people living in church like this. They really think they're going to get to heaven by being in church, you know? And then you ask them, how do you know you're a Christian? Well, I go to church. Or I'm a good person. I, I work, I pray, I read my Bible. Yeah, well, that doesn't mean anything. 
How do you know you're a Christian? Jesus is in my boat. <laughs> Christ is in my life. There was a time when I got to the end of myself and my failure, and I invited him in to be a part of my life. That's how I know I'm a Christian. Ask me how you know I'm saved. I know. He, he lives within, within my heart. I know I'm a child of God. How? Because Jesus lives. You ever have doubts? Well, I'll tell you. When I first got saved, I had a lot of doubts. The more I became familiar with, the, familiar with God's word, then the less doubts I had. But it starts with this place of inviting him in, allowing him to be a part of it. And then that supernatural life. Jesus said, I've come to him, I'd have life abundantly. Then God begins to do something that brings real, real internal satisfaction and grace and glory. The fourth lesson from failure is that it brings us to, if it really is working in our life, to the place where we humbly begin to follow Jesus Christ. Jesus turns to them and he said, what are you going to do here? I want you to cast your nets down. I want you to follow me. The miracle, that thing is, and more than the fish, was that they left their nets and they left their boats. Try to get a fisherman to do that today. <laughs> I'd get my wife up before I get my boat up. Not me, okay, just, <laughs> I don't have a boat. Probably best, amen. The idea here is, folks, you know, that there's this willingness to follow Christ. Has this ever changed? I mean, in the gospel, in the word of God? I mean, this whole idea of Christianity, it, this is what it boils down to, following Jesus. You say, you know, I, I'm a Christian. Do you follow Jesus? Well, no, then you're not a Christian. Follow me. I mean, that's the first two words out of his mouth in the process of making real disciples, follow me. And if you're still following you and living for you and doing what you want to do, and you're always first place above God, over God, beyond God, you're going to do what you want to do no matter what others say, no matter what the Bible says, no matter what the preacher says, you're going to do it. Hey, and you're lost and you're dying and you're on your way to hell. That's kind of a weenie, come on. <laughs> kind of a little wimpy on the edge. Try it again. You know I'm right. Because what I'm saying, and why you know I'm right, is because this is exactly the words, it's in red letter, follow me. And that message has not changed. That's the goal. That's the, that's the intent of Christ coming. To, to, first of all, for us to have this relationship with him, of following him. And then after that comes that relationship. We're now disciples, not only following, but doing what he's called us to do. It says Peter realized his sinfulness, didn't he? He saw this great display of God and it made him realize just what is, how separated from God he was. Boy, sometimes that's exactly what happens in our life. We see the grace and the glory of God in the cross of Jesus Christ and we begin to realize that he is God and how, how we are not God and how we're selfish and self-seeking and self-motivated and it should bring us to the place to realize this miracle of crucifixion and resurrection for us. This, this, this demonstration of love for us should humble us. But how often, if we really get honest, have we seen God do so many things around us and we just kind of take it for granted when all the time those should be the things, if our eyes are open, if our heart is tender, that calls us to be at the place that says, man, God does love me. And God's meeting me right here in the midst of my own stupidity and right in the midst of my own failure. Now, obviously, I don't, I don't want you to miss this. You know, this point of failure, because it brings us to something beyond ourselves, all right? It pushes us out of the realm of me, of, of, the, of the whole universe revolving around me. Now it revolves around someone else, and it revolves around the Lord Jesus now. Because the goal here, and, and the whole, if we said each miracle's in the context of something, the context here is that the, the Lord's calling men to himself, and those that he calls to himself, he will he will do a work in them that gives them the same goal that he has of calling men to Jesus Christ. He says, you know, I want you to do something. I want you to follow me. The great lesson, you know, about all of this is, is well, obviously we can't do anything without the Lord, but now that we do have the Lord, he's called us to do something. And it's more than just catching stinky fish. All right? It's more than the norm. And it's for every child of God. Follow me. And I'll make you fishers of what? Excuse me? Fishers of men? What do you mean by becoming... Well, they understood the context. I believe they understood the idea. He just called them. He just made... He, he had just fished them in, so to say. They had just been caught themselves. And now they're supposed to become not just caught. They're supposed to become catchers. Because that's the goal of this miracle, I believe, is to bring us to the relationship of realizing without Christ we can be nothing. So we surrender to him and do his word. And upon doing his word, he gives us this great ministry, this great 
goal in our life, this, this, great, this great plan of being involved in God's plan, something that's bigger than me. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's nice to have a vocation in life, but this goes beyond vocation even. It's nice to have career, but this goes beyond career. We find out now if I have vocation and career, it really just supplements the greater goal, and that's for God to use me in this world. God's given me a job, that's good, it meets the needs, so I can be what God wants me to be in my life. So I can reach people for Christ, so I can, I can make a difference in the world that I'm in. And what I'm coming to this, in this place, in this message, is saying, hey, once you get to the end of, uh, of yourself and you realize that, that there's nothing there, you, you turn to God and you embrace Him in your life, and then He says, not only am I going to save you, give you life, I'm going to use you in giving other people life. And if you realize what's saying, this is not, some Christians groan at this point. I don't get that, you know. Oh, you mean I got to tell people about Jesus? I don't like that. Anybody laughing at me? I don't want to be laughed at. I don't want them saying Jesus jokes about me. I don't want them picking on me. I don't want them calling me preacher. I don't want them calling me Jesus free. I don't want to do that. I can't. This is the lesson to be learned here. You can't, but he can. He can't, so you need to be changed, so he does. And now that you're changed, you have the capacity to do whatever he wants you to do. Why aren't you doing it? What's the problem here? He says, you know, the result of this whole miracle is I'll make you fishers of men. You know, there's an infant variety of fish, but there's an even more infant variety of men. Amen. That God says, I want, I want to bring you into it. You know, you used to go out and, and the whole thing was kind of like you're hunting fish and catching fish. Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, I like hunting. I, I like, I know, I'll try to make it more politically appealing. I like harvesting Animals. I'm going to get one of those bumper stickers that says, I love animals no matter how you cook them. <laughs> and, you know, especially when I, when I was in my 20s, I kind of got addicted to it. I'll be honest with you. Kathy's not here this morning to preach to me about it. I got addicted to it. You know, I just had to have everything for hunting. You know, there's hunting clothes. You know, it's kind of stupid because you get all these hunting clothes and then you get in a deer blind where they can't see you anyway. So, you know, got to get the hunting clothes. You gotta get the hunting rifle, you gotta make sure it's the right rifle, it's gotta have a scope on it, so you gotta get a good scope, and then you gotta, you know, you gotta get your little hunting hat, you know. And then, uh, then some states wanna make you wear the orange hat, you know, even if you're in Texas and you hunt in the public lands, you gotta wear an orange hat. You know, I thought that was stupid, and I found out deer were colorblind. I thought, well then what's the whole uniform about? <laughs> Then you gotta have hunting boots, you know, and then you gotta have, you know, the right kind of strap on your gun, and you gotta get the right bullets, and you got all this stuff, and you, you know, there's that point, praise God for, for a woman who, who loved me enough to say, I think we have enough guns. <laughs> you know, I think we have enough hunting stuff. No, you don't need a bigger deer lease. You know, you don't need an ATV. You know. Praise God for good women, I'd be poor today. But I mean, it was a big deal. I love hunting. I just, you know, hunt, you know, and the animals and killing them and cleaning, all that stuff. I really, I really enjoy it. And I still like hunting. I'm just not addicted to it anymore. But the thing about it is, you want to get addicted to, 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 to big game hunting, this is what it's all about. Because that's the whole idea here. Hunting fish and catching them. All right? Now, here, we don't eat these fish, by the way, all right? We're not cannibalistic. The idea here is that we go out and we become fishers of men. And we use what God's given us, and he's given us all the right equipment by the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life and by the power of the Word of God and the authority of prayer to make a difference, you know? You know, I, I don't need to have the rifle and the camo gear and what they call the buck grunt, you know, make this noise, just call the bucky and all that stuff. But I want you to know, when we get our eyes open and realize God, the blessing God's given us, hey, you can all join the game hunting game. You can all be a part because there's no greater prize the men for the glory of God. And no, we're not collecting them like pelts hanging off our belts. You know, I got so many scalps and all that kind of stuff and putting their heads on my wall. I wouldn't want your head on my wall. <laughs> Nor would you want mine. And, and you say, what are you talking about? Listen, the whole idea, when Jesus said, I, I want you to become fishers of men, and no longer will you, will you just fish men. You're gonna, he says, you're going to catch 
You know, you don't catch fish, you're going to catch men. In fact, the word catch is really unique in the Greek language. Again, these words are uniquely there because the Holy Spirit inspires them. It's the word zagorn. And literally, it's the actual word that we get the word, the first of this word, we get for our English word, Z-O-O. Y'all know what that spells? I knew you were smart. Zoo. All right. What happens at the zoo? You go and see the animals. They're not dead. All right. They're alive, and there's alive animals of all kinds. This is that word which we get that literal English word from, zoo. And it's zugoran, and it's used zugoro, and it's used different tenses in different ways. But the idea is you are catching, you're taking animals alive, is what he uses this word for. And they're being placed for display. Now, we aren't putting people in zoos, all right? Literally, to catch alive means that when we do catch them, when we do tell them about Jesus, when they do offer their lives to Christ, they become alive. Life comes in for the first time. Because in reality, the Bible tells us we're all dead in our trespasses and in our sin. But when we come to Christ, boom, the Bible says in the King James Version, we are quickened. And that's a good word. It literally means we made alive in the moment. And that's what happens when our lives are collected in the net of God's Holy Spirit and His Word, and our hearts are surrendered to Jesus, boom, we're brought to life. Now, that's big game hunting, amen? That's big time. That's, it doesn't get much better than that, that you actually can participate in the will of God and the grace of God and the plan of God, you know, to be a part of God's program and to be a part of God's purposes in bringing other people to know Christ. That's why we do what we do. You know, we have a great vision statement for our church that says something like we're here to, you know, about bringing people into to a relationship with Jesus, into membership into the body of Christ so that they can mature in their walk with Christ, so they can discover their ministry. And, and from there, they go on to magnify the Lord's name by being involved in missions. All these M's that are in there. Let me give it to you in two words what all that means. Make disciples. Go fish. Make disciples. That's what Jesus' first words to make disciples. And at this miraculous moment, he gives them the, the bottom line of what this whole issue for those of us who know Jesus and have been left here on the planet, what we're supposed to be doing. Make disciples. Make disciples. In fact, it's so much a part of what we do when he, Jesus is leaving those same men right before he's taken up into glory. And when the angel says this same Jesus will come again in like manner, right before that happens, he turns to him and says this, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. Go make disciples. Same word. Catch men. Keep catch. And aren't you glad they did? Aren't you glad they were faithful to the promise? You would not be sitting here if those men hadn't been faithful to the command of God. But how many more people would be sitting here today if we'd all be faithful to the commandments of God? If we'd all be faithful to this mission in life, this purpose, but the things that ought to drive us in life of just being faithful to God, say, I want to be used by God. I want to catch men. And by the way, when I go deer hunting, I cheat. I put out corn. Deer love corn. You know how many deer I've killed eating corn? 90% of them I've killed. Doesn't seem fair. Well, neither is it in this other big game industry. All around, people are sitting at feeders. <laughs> Everywhere you go, there's people looking for something, trying to satisfy something. And, it's, you know, and Satan's drawn them into a trap. But we come and we step into that situation, and we got something they really need. How many times, for you that have been faithless, you could bear witness to what I'm talking about. How many, it might even be a perfect stranger. You just say something to, and that you didn't realize they were at the feeder. <laughs> And all of a sudden, they respond. Going through Walmart one day, I said something to a lady there, and she starts crying. Just because I said something about, you know, your God really loves you. <laughs> uh, get my gun out. <laughs> my gospel gun. She's, she's at the feeder. <laughs> she's ready to come on home. I want to catch them alive. There's, that, that's, you know, anybody in this room who's ever had a part in bringing somebody to Christ you know that's one of the most exciting, most blessed, most fun things in the Christian life you ever do. I mean, it really is. It just gets fun. It's just, it just gets exciting to see people's lives. You've been on mission trips. You've seen it happen. You've walked away from those situations like you were on cloud nine. How'd that happen? 
Well, not because you're so smart. Because you allowed God to be God in your life. You allowed that authority that God has all authority over all things to work in your heart and in your life. You allowed yourself to be obedient to the promises of God. You go make, you, you, you follow me and I will make you. God says, I'll do something in you. You say, well, I can't do it. That's what this is all about. He can. We've done it all night. It didn't work. He can. I used to. Well, he can still. All right? He can still work in such a way as to transform your life. And by the way, when you look at this command in Scripture, the verb tense is, is, is unique. But it's the idea of an ongoing process. So what the Lord Jesus is saying is, you know, it, it's, it's a commitment to reach people for Christ. And the call to do that really doesn't end. It just goes on and on and on. Hey, deer season, you know my worst two things I hated about deer season? One is that it ended. I thought that was just stupid. You know, why, why have seasons? And the second one was, it could end early if you shoot up all your deer you're supposed to shoot. You only get so many tags. Those years it was two bucks and two does, and once it was over, you didn't get to hunt anymore. Well, that just takes all the fun out of it, too. But not so with this kind of game hunting, amen. Not so with catching men. It's a non-ending season, and you don't have to worry about permits and tags. We just keep on keeping on. We just keep on making a difference. We just keep being salt. We just keep being light. We just, see, we just keep seeing people's lives transformed because we just, we're just in the will of God and we're just moving according to the plan of God. And God begins to open doors to us. Here in, in, in a week or so, we're going to announce to you again a new, a, a new class. We've done EE in the past and, and GROW and some other evangelistic training. But I think we have a, a, a group of folks, some who need to be refreshed in those things, and some who really say, I, I just don't feel like I have the equipment. I want to teach you how easy it is and how simple it is to make a difference in other people's lives. We'll be announcing that in the days ahead of us. So there's really no reason. that God's, God's ready to fill us with His Spirit, equip us with His Word. We just need to step out in boldness, and He gives us that even if we'll just step out. We'll just obey Christ. The taking of people alive. And now they're on display like we are, like salt and light. And we're living now, not in a zoo, praise God, we're in the kingdom. Living life to the fullest. Because life outside the kingdom is where the circus is, all right? It's empty and it's meaningless and it has nothing to do with us. I'll close with these four points about this word that we need receiving from the Lord. It's obvious for, for, for Peter it was a personal word. It was that rhema word where God spoke to him. It was something he just had to say to him. But now, you know, God speaks those words to us. It's a personal word. God, God is saying to us, you know, in his word about being fishers of men, about taking people alive. I, I have something for you. In other words, it's something. Yeah, it blesses those who come to Christ. I really believe it blesses me almost as equally. It's just as fulfilling. It's just as satisfying. But it's not just a, a personal word. It's practical. God's going to do this. It becomes very practical. It's practical, obviously, that a lot of fish were taken. Practical, obviously, that people are being reached for the kingdom. And God is practical in the way that he doesn't send this out on our own. Because, again, remember, this miracle of fish is about the presence of God on the scene to enable that's why they follow Jesus, so they're made able. That's why we obey the Lord. Matthew, when the last words of Jesus, go make disciples, I'm with you. He gives us the, 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 the practicality of it and the promise that he's there. You know, and there's this promise, obviously, of rewards. There was reward and obedience about the fish and the rewards in, in, in life for Peter and these disciples as they follow the Lord. There's rewards and practical blessings for our life. Most of all, it's a very powerful word. When Jesus said all authority, it means I've got everything you need so you can follow me and you can trust me. Nobody has any more authority in this world than me. Nobody has any more power in this world than me. So you can lean on me and you can believe me and you can get out in the deep waters and cast your nets out in life because I'm going to meet you there. I'm not going to abandon you there. Jesus told his disciples before he departed, you know, they're going to put, I'm going to put you in situations before kings even and powerful people and potentates and rulers, but don't be afraid about what you're supposed to say. Just go do it and you'll find, I'll give you what you're supposed to say. And that same lesson is true. Can we trust God for the power of his word and the promise of his word? That when I go, and if it's just to speak to somebody in the store, or speak to somebody at the school, or speak to somebody at the gas station, will I be willing to open my mouth and trust God? And when I do, boom, miracles happen. Miracles happen. In fact, I believe in miracles at every moment in that regard because I believe even if that person should turn around and cuss me out, I got the last word. Yeah, you know I got the last word. 
Because my word doesn't go away. Because it's Jesus' word. I had a brother who used to come witness me all the time. I, I laughed him in the face. I made jokes. I tell Jesus jokes. I just put him down. I'm such a fool. Do you know what? He'd walk out of there, smile on his face. I'd walk out of there like I was a real big stud or something. I was dying inside. He's right. I'm wrong. I'm not right. He's, what he's saying is the truth. Because your word's not like their word. Your word's a living word. And you'll get over your pity party in a day or two. <laughs> but you've had the powerful opportunity of letting God use you in your life. Are you? Are you letting God do something with you? Are you letting God do something in you? If not, there's no reason why you shouldn't. And I really believe that what happens too often is that we get comfortable in our Christian walk in life. And now Christianity becomes about us, you know? You know what you, know, you can tell it becomes about you? It comes about you when everybody kind of has to say the right thing and do the right thing. You know, you leave church mad. You know, the song service has to be just right. The preaching has to be just right. Not too long. Or you're not happy. You know, if, if Brother Sammy doesn't shake your hand or say hi to you, then your feelings are hurt. You know, or it's, it's just, just, you just, you get into this cynical mode and this, this critical mode that is so unlike Jesus. So you leave and you approach the world with that same way. You know, they're not going to listen. They don't care. They're not concerned. They, people are dying all around us. People are hurting. Everybody you look at almost in the world is going through something. And you, you have the answers right there in your hand. Why don't you reach it out? Why don't you invite them to Christ? Invite them to church. You know, give them a scripture. Hey, let me just tell you, hey, you know, I was there, I've been there, and you probably have, because that's the kind of people God brings you in touch with a lot, isn't it? I've been there. I'm going to tell you what God did for me. You know what happens? You're no longer living this little subpar Christian life. You're starting rising with the wind, letting the Spirit of God move you forward in life. And everybody who's been there knows exactly what I'm talking about. Amen? If you've departed in any way in your life from realizing the, the glory of God and the grace of God that He shows us to let us be a part of His kingdom, if you've kind of stepped off and become little... You know, that person where the universe circles around you instead of around God. And I'd say today, you fall on your face like Peter and say, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Because that's the essence of our sin anyway. Isn't it self-centeredness? I'm a sinful man. I don't deserve to be around you. <laughs> and that's what we think. God won't, God won't do anything with me. Then what does Jesus do? He picks him and says, follow me. You don't think, you, I want you to be with me. Well, there's two extremes, isn't it? How many people just running from God? I, I'm not worthy. I'm, come with me. Come with me. Walk with me. I'll make you fishers of men. You think that was something? That's a big deal. That ain't nothing. See what I can do. The impact we can make. And they did. And the world was changed. And we can still make changes. And we can still increase the kingdom in population because we're faithful. That's our goal. Be fishers of men. Would you stand with your heads bowed?